This week on the show, we have Dan Barhava, the author of the action-packed thriller, The 36 Watchers. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivation advice to leave you feeling inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of replacing complaining and anger with love and gratitude. The reality is life is short, so why not spend your time enjoying life as opposed to always worrying and complaining about the things that you don't have? When we begin replacing complaining and anger with love and gratitude, life becomes filled with limitless opportunities to be grateful. So often we take life for granted and get caught up with the grind of life, forgetting what a privilege it is to be alive and thriving. But when we take a moment to be grateful for the fullness that life has to offer and fill our hearts with love, we begin to see life from a different lens, a lens filled with love, blessings, and opportunities. With the holidays just around the corner, use this as an opportunity to fill your life with less complaining and more gratitude, less worrying and more living. As Mary Davis quotes, the more grateful I am, the more beauty I see. Stay tuned, coming up after the break. And I, I wanna talk about the main character, Jenna. I know she's a supernatural heroine. Uh, so let's talk about her and how she's at the helm of power in this book series. Well, the thing about Jenna that I, I'm so happy, a lot of people when they read the review, when I read the reviews that people write, they talk about how much they love Jenna and it makes me happy because Jenna is a human and a watcher. If you think about Jenna at the beginning of book one, Think about New York City, September 10, 2001, mm -hmm. before September 11. And New York City was all positive, all light, all activity, all action. And that was Jenna. And then the world changed and then Jenna was changing with it. So she, as she grows more into being a watcher, she struggles to maintain a humanity. She increases her powers, but she stay connected to her humanity and feelings and flaws. Wardrobe provided by Le Chateau. Next on the show, we have Dan Bar Hava, author of the book series, The 36 Watchers. Hava's exhilarating book series reveals an exclusive secret society that is in the last line of defense for humanity against great evil. This supernatural action thriller will keep you turning the page to see what happens next. Dan, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Before we get into your thrilling book, The 36 Watchers, I want to talk a little bit about the beginning. I know that you moved to the U.S. after serving in the military. So tell us about that time in your life. Well, uh, the military is a very interesting time because you get exposed to things that people do not get exposed to in regular life. Uh, it starts with things like basic training and action and uh, combat experience, power shooting. For this particular book, um, I served time in Gaza, which also uh, figures very much into what the book is about, especially book two. So all those things, when I was in the service, they made me want to be able to tell stories because I had experiences to share. And uh, I believe that that's part of what made me do what I'm doing today. Very nice. And I know prior to writing The 36 Watchers, uh, you did co-write the romantic comedy Falling Star with Natasha Lyonne and Adam Pascal. So tell us about that experience. Well, uh, Natasha Lyonne was in between two very big things at the time. She was between the American Pie movies and Orange in the Blue Black. So we were just very, very fortunate to uh, be able to get her to that little production. And what I remember was that we were in a hotel in upstate New York where most of the film was being shot. And it was the third day of filming and I was at the lobby with cast and crew and the door opened and she walked in. And when she walked in, the whole place became electrified because everybody realized that this is real. And that was a terrific feeling. I remember it to this very day. And uh, the other uh, person in the film, uh, Adam Pascal, who was the star, he was the headliner of Rent for the entire run of Rent on Broadway, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I uh, wrote a song, was the theme song of this movie. I had the pleasure of taking him into the recording studio. And I worked with good singers. 
but him was a different experience. It's like, you know, imagine if you drive uh, Acura or Honda or any one of those good, reliable cars, and all of a sudden you are behind the wheel of a Bentley. Um, so that was an amazing experience as well. And I cherish those moments and those memories. Very nice. And fast forward, let's talk about your book series, The 36 Watchers. You know, this book has mythical creatures, time travel, secret society. So tell us a little bit about the premise of the book. What I like to do is I like to find facts that exist in the world and I like to weave them into a narrative of a fictional story, but it makes people wonder what is real and what is not, because that's the way I'm built. So to, to uh, demonstrate how this works, um, I'm going to quote from a review of the book and from a response to the review of the book. So uh, from the review, uh, the reviewer says, what impressed me most about this book was that when you did research, it was relatable to historical facts such as the content of the Talmud, facts about Judas and the crucifixion, and many others you would find by reading this exceptional book. So when I read that review, I was very happy because this is my aim. And then uh, the other quote I would like to do is from a response to this very review. And the response is, I like the concept of having powers embedded into the watch's DNA. I enjoy this type of books that can merge science, history, and religion. The electron spin catch my attention for sure. Despite this being fiction, it has the additional perk of learning about new cultures and traditions and geography. I'm wondering how much you can learn while reading and enjoying fiction. That's the premise of the book. Dan, how did you come up with this concept of the book? Because it's so elaborate. So how did you kind of think about this? I cannot claim copyright for the 36 Watchers. This exists in the world. Uh, it's a myth. Uh, it's a little bit like the four wise men in the nativity scene on mm -hmm. Christmas, mm -hmm. but the Jewish version of it. Because uh, there is a Jewish holiday uh, every fall where uh, if you are observant, you build a shed in your backyard to commemorate the 40 years that the Jews spend in the desert after escaping slavery in Egypt. And there is a myth about people that visit these sheds because it's a... a you are obligated to welcome anyone into the shed in the holiday. That's the premise of the holiday. And there are whispers about people that exist in every generation, the 36 of them. It's a quote from Jewish scripture. It only mentions in one place, but it's a thing. So 36 is something that exists. Mm -hmm. I did not make it up. I just took it and rendered it, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to talk about the main character, Jenna. I know she's a supernatural heroine. Uh, so let's talk about her and how she's at the helm of power in this book series. Well, the thing about Jenna that I, I'm so happy, a lot of people, when they read the review, when I read the reviews that people write, they talk about how much they love Jenna. And it makes me happy because Jenna is a human and a watcher. If you think about Jenna at the beginning of book one, think about New York City, September 10, 2001, mm -hmm. before September 11. And New York City was all positive, all light, all activity, all action. And that was Jenna. And then the world changed and then Jenna was changing with it. So she, as she grows more into being a watcher, she struggles to maintain a humanity. She increases her powers, but she stays connected to her humanity and feelings and flaws. And she's flawed, uh, which I think makes her more lovable. And in the second book, uh, there are things that she uh, messes up on and misses. And uh, one of the nice things that happened is that when my friend and editor, Alex, was editing the book, he at some point called me and said, hey, I completely missed that. Jenna messed up. And I planted that in the book in a way that is not easy to see. So she evolves from this young, somewhat naive, all positive into a more worldly, with when the powers of being a watcher and the power of being human and the quality of being human are struggling within her and she struggles to maintain that balance. And I think people connect with that very much. Mm -hmm. For our viewers that want to better understand, you know, you do talk about a secret society and the 36 watchers. So tell us what the watchers are. So the watchers in my book are, um, in my book, the universe of the 36 watchers 
and the watchers are the actual only real secret society that protects humanity everything else be it illuminati or freemasons or templars or was in cushions or any any other thing it's just a shell of the real thing and the real thing are the watchers no one knows who they are and they are the protectors of humanity from great evil and that is the premise and it's really fact based in terms of what i take into the story uh and again like i said before i like to make people wonder what is real what is not and that's how the watcher function in the universe of the book Mm -hmm. And let's talk about book two of The Watchers, or The 36 Watchers. Uh, what can fans expect from this one? So, book one was about a global event that is connected to The Watchers. Book two is also about the global event. But in book two, Jenna, as a full-fledged Watcher, after being through the process of training, she single-handedly almost affects that global event. So I think people will be very uh, curious to read and to discover what event that is. Obviously, I cannot give that. It's a big spoiler. Uh, but that's a big part of what book two uh, contains. And the other thing that book two contains is, again, uh, defrocking some myth. Uh, an example I can share is Kabbalah. Kabbalah is uh, sort of esoteric Jewish traditional magic that was made very big in the world in the 90s and the 2000s where celebrities like Madonna took it and ran with it. There was a lot of tattooing and a lot of charms and bracelets. And I talk about that and I basically uh, defrock the myth behind it. And the other things like that also happen in the book. And people can look forward to that. Very nice. And can we expect book three? And I feel like this would be a great movie. <laughs> Did you ever think of, of that idea of bringing this to the big screen? I wish I had that review, <laughs> that review response right here because I don't have it. But one of the responses to the review uh, that was written, um, and by the way, I need to really give a nice shout to onlinebookclub.org because they are uh, providing me with amazing reviews and amazing responses, and I really appreciate that. So one of the response was, I would like to see a movie made out of it because I watched a lot of movies in this mall, this will fit right in and it will be great. So yeah, I write visually. I very much visualize everything I write from uh, super mundane things like having breakfast or a snack to epic supernatural struggle with evil powers that can uh, alternate reality and distort uh, timelines. Uh, but everything is visual, so it will make a great movie, yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And I know this is your first novel that you ever wrote. What's it been like seeing the feedback from um, some of your readers? It's very, it's great. Uh, and I have to say that the feedback also helped me grow because book one is good and book two is better. Uh, so it's an amazing feel to get people responses and people treat the characters like real entities and Characters are at the heart of the writing. So when people talk about Jenna or Uncle Josh or her boyfriend Chris or best friend Stephanie, and there's a bad guy in the books that I found a great backstory for him that is real. Uh, uh, and his name is Gonar. He's the evil, ultimate bad guy. People talk with him like they're real characters. That is very, very satisfying for me uh, when I get this feedback. And I also get a lot of support from my publisher, Austin McCauley, and I can't thank them enough for that. Uh, I, I, I was right to join forces with them back in 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. And Dan, what's your favorite chapter in this book series? Because there's so many different chapters. Which is your favorite to write? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. Uh, my favorite chapter to write was a chapter about Kabbalah. Uh, because it's a standalone chapter, uh, I had it in my head, top to bottom. All I had to do is just listen to the voice in my head and write it. It takes place in 13th century Spain. Uh, so I had the whole visual of a Spanish harbor city and the, the, the wharf and the people and the way they dress, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they drink. Uh, it all happened like that and it was something that wrote itself and at the time i was isolated during covid it was like 2021 
and uh, I wrote that chapter from 11 a.m. Uh, from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. until there was light in the window, and that was my favorite thing to do. That was the best chapter uh, in terms of like fun experience to have. I may have more satisfaction from other places, but this was the most fun to write, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I can tell this is not just like a book series to you. This is something you're truly passionate about. So it's really nice to see that this is a passion project for you and it's successful. So it's great. Thank you very much. I really, uh, you know, I, a lot of experiences in my life led me here. Um, you know, I landed in New York City with $700 in my pocket and that's it. Mm. And, you know, to, to, to be in the city and to go to the place I went, um, it's very uplifting. I want to share that thought and that feeling uh, that anything is possible. You know, put enough effort into it, it works. With Austin McCulley, I went downtown to their offices. I wanted to see the people I'm going to work with. I did not have an appointment. They wouldn't let me upstairs. I called them and I convinced them to let me upstairs. And uh, that's how I approach everything. I want to get it done in the best way possible. So that's uh, that's the feeling that I get when these two books are finally out. And there's a book three in my head as well. Uh, book three is more in the premise of like the Empire Strikes Back in the Star Wars series. Mm -hmm. In book three, the evil powers are trying to like get Jenna. And uh, I need to shape that and sit that and write that, but that's the premise. So that's what people can expect. Mm -hmm. And Dan, you have many accolades as well as being an author. I know that you also are a teacher of music in the Manhattan School of Music. So tell us about that as well. Manhattan School of Music is a great place. Uh, I auditioned to be a student in Manhattan School of Music via video. I sent a videotape, they accepted me. But when I wanted a scholarship, they said, uh, you must come audition in person. And that was probably the single most humbling experience of my life because I come from Jerusalem, Israel. I was a big fish in a small pond. I go to my next school of music. I go to the hallway, uh, sitting, waiting for my turn. There were like 80 of me waiting to be auditioned. Um, that was slap in the face and a big, big motivator as well. So I went to the school, I got my degrees there and I teach there now. Uh, in the pre-college division and those students keep me sharp, keep me on my toes. They are amazing. Every year it starts, the pre-college run on Saturdays. And the first thing I say in every class to the 16 and 17 year olds, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant children and kids and young adults. Uh, I tell them that I salute them because when I was 16, I would not give up my Saturday like this to pursue my dream. <laughs> I did not have that motivation, but they do, and it shows. It's amazing. And Dan, I created my platform to uplift, to inspire, and to showcase that anything is possible. So I have two questions. How do you think that grit and determination has played a part in your success? And for anyone watching that's going through a hard time, what would you say to inspire and uplift them? I, I think that, you know, you want to stick with your story. You want to push forward to what you want to accomplish you want to stay focused and you want to have the drive to not stop, even if it feels like you should stop. Uh, a lot of people come to New York City and a lot of people give up and don't stay because city is hard. Mm -hmm. But if you stick with it and if you have enough energy, that $700 I came up with ran out pretty quickly. I had to do a lot of stuff to stay alive and stay afloat. I paid $400 a month for a closet to sleep in when I first got here, the first couple of years. Uh, but you really, really, uh, there is a way, there is a path. And again, going to Austin McCulley Publishing House and getting a face-to-face -face with them was an example of do not abide by what is given to you, strive for more. Sometimes the door is not gonna open, but that should not uh, distract you from trying to open the, all, all the doors you can knock on. Some of them will open, and if you knock on enough doors, enough of them will open to get you where you want to be. I guess that's a good way of putting it as any. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes opportunities are not just presented to you. You have to make your own opportunities, right? You have to knock on the door, you have to insist, and you have to get in there, right? You have to have the grit to keep going when you get a no. No means next opportunity. So I love that uh, that you said that because I think that's very true and, and I think it'll help a lot of people watching uh, this uh, episode. And for our viewers that want to watch the 36 watchers, sorry, to read the 36 watchers and purchase your books, where can they do so? Thank you so much, Mr. Jeff Bezos. I'm going to help making the rich men in the world a little bit richer. Go to Amazon. Everything is there. Everything is available. And if you drop me a line, I would love that because that's what people look. The book is available in many platforms and all of them. But Amazon is the place to go. And again, thank you, Jeff Bezos. That's, that's it. We're going to link all that information for our viewers to purchase the book. Dan, thank you so much for being on the show today and congratulations on all your success. Dariel, amazing. Thank you so much for making me feel comfortable and at home. Uh, I can't be happier. I, can, I cannot be happier than the way I feel right now after talking to you. Thank you. Pack TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook. Yeah.